Good morning, uh, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, really an honor to be here to join. I was asked by the organizer to be the moderator. So you have to support me a little bit during this interesting symposium. And I think the very first thing I would like to, to begin with is to ask uh, Sheikh uh, Jamal uh, Abdari you know, to give uh, a speech of uh, welcoming uh, everybody here. Uh, but let me tell you who is uh, Sheikh uh, Jamal Dari. He is coming from a very, very prominent Iraqi families that goes till the leadership of uh, a tribe, uh, Zoba, in, uh, in Iraq. The, the family are very well known through the whole last century and now for struggling for the freedom of Iraq and the, uh, the independence of Iraq from the British occupation of Iraq. And the family again in uh, 2003, after the occupation of Iraq, Sheikh Jamal, his brothers, his cousins, and especially his uh, uncle, Sheikh Harit, uh, did resist to the occupation and have their own vision about the solution of uh, Iraq. Uh, re just uh, recently, Sheikh uh, Jamal launched uh, uh, some initiatives, and I would like to say especially three of them. The establishment of the Iraqi Forum for intellectuals, Iraqi intellectuals and academics that is based in uh, Turkey, in Istanbul, as well as the Iraq Stability and Security Program, which was just recently established in the uh, United States, in Washington. He's also chairing the organization uh, PAFI that is uh, inviting us for this event. So, Sheikh, the floor is yours. Sheikh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. السيدات والسادة الحضور أسعدني أن أرحب بكم وأشكر لكم الاستجابة الكريمة لدعوة منظمتنا سفراء من أجل العراق وحضور مؤتمرنا الأول تحت عنوان نحو سلام ومصالحة في العراق وأستهل الفرصة لأشكر جمهورية لاتفيا to thank لإحضانها هذا التجمع الديمقراطي الحر خصوصاً بعد ترأسها مجموعة دول الاتحاد الأوروبي ونتمنى لهذا البلد حكومة وشعباً دوام النجاح والسلام والازدهار أعزائي بلاد النهرين Iraq today is a land of two rivers. Today is Iraq, a land of two rivers. Was and continues to have the authentic and influential impact on human history. It never was just an occurrence of a legacy of human civilization. Iraq's problems and crises. are never continued within the geographical borders. And that is a distinctive historical pattern. Therefore, when Iraq sneezes, the whole region, i.e. the Middle East, catches the cold. And when it is recovers, and the whole region also will recover with it and with its stability. إن بلدي العراق أصبح لاعبا فاعلا في الحدث العالمي سواء بالسلبي أو الإيجاب ومنه بدأت القصة وبه تنتهي الحكاية سواء بنهاية سعيدة أو مأساوية لا سمح الله أصدقاء الحضور إن الإرهاب وكل العوارض السلبية Negative symptoms of extremism, corruption, moral degradation, and horrific violence of human rights applied equally by all conflicting sides in Iraq. 
a calamity inflicted on my country due to the interconnected, interconnected and interacting internal and external factors. Dear friends, منذ عام 2003 بدأت المشكلة الكبرى في العراق ولن تحل هذه المشكلة مع سلسلة المشاكل والأزمات والكوارث التي تدحرجت مثل كرة الثلج بعد عام 2003 إلا بفعل وعمل خارجي إيجابي من الأطراف الدولية كمسؤولية أخلاقية وقانونية تبقى دينا في رقبتها وحاجة ماسة لوقف نزيف الدم المتواصل بين أبناء بلدي وهنا أود أن أشير إلى كمية الدم المراقب وبالأرقام الحقيقية تلك التي حصلت في صراع أكثر من تلك التي حصلت في صراعات أخرى في الشرق الأوسط وأن الجزء الأكبر من هذا الدم المراق للأسف هو نتاج التدخل الإيراني وفق any other conflict in the Middle East. It's also worth noticing that the largest part of this blood loss is due to the Iranian intervention in Iraq that is based on the negative ideology that considers the spilling of Iraqi blood as the beginning of the civilization of an integral and profit. The prophecy my fear that the word Iraq would, would be confined to the history unless efforts are to help on the Iraqi people and to save them from the hell that they are now. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I will come again and I welcome you and I hope you will enjoy and contribute towards this conference in order to help to achieve an everlasting peace and especially give my regards and my thanks to everyone and those who are involved. And thank you. Thank you very much, Sheikh uh, Jamal, for your address. I would like to make some uh, you know, remarks concerning this conference that the people, they were asked to speak in this, uh, during these two days, have, in a way or another, some link with the Iraqi crisis from their own uh, position or uh, they used to work there or from their own capitals. So uh, I think the organizers tried to bring the maximum of experience, especially at this moment, which is really very, very critical. Uh, again, Iraq is very important since ISIS occupy, and we have the problem of terrorism again. But unfortunately, it's much more as a reaction, an international reaction, than really resolve, uh, resolving the whole problem of Iraq from the beginning and the national reconciliation, which is so strongly needed, a uh, real. Uh, one. I have on my list of speakers for this uh, first session the Honorable Peter Hoekstra, a former member of the United States House of Representatives who served in a different committee and he was uh, involved and following very closely the position in Iraq. So uh, let me welcome him and give him the floor for his remarks. Thank you. It's good to be with you today. Sheikh, thank you for uh, your opening comments and putting it in context that this conference is about healing Iraq and that the world community has a responsibility to come together and to solve or at least assist the Iraqi people 
in healing that country and creating an environment that is more secure, more safe, and more prosperous. Because as we all recognize today, that since 9-11, since the overthrow of the regime of Saddam Hussein, the country, the region, and the world are much less safe and secure than what they were before. Who would have thought that today we'd be in a position where the government of Yemen has been overthrown, where the government of Libya or the nations of Libya, Iraq, and Syria are basically failed states. Some may dispute the claim of a failed state. By my definition, a failed state is a central government that has lost control of a significant portion of its geographic area. And that is true for all three of those countries. And in that type of a region, in that type of condition, you also need to think about the implications for the other countries. What does it mean for Jordan? What does it mean for Lebanon? What does it mean for other countries in the area? The focus of this conference, and you know, I come from the United States Congress. I spent 10 years on quote unquote what we and people in the United States sometimes say it's, it's not a relevant title to be used in the US Congress. I served on what was called the Intelligence Committee. Uh, and they would say there's not much intelligence to be found in Congress. But today, as we begin this conference, what we're asked to do is we're asked to step aside. I come with strong, a, a strong background in taking a look at what has happened in Iraq. I've come with a strong background of understanding our Congress and have strong ideas about where we should go and what we should need to do. But in that way, I'm very similar to many of you. We all have ideas, we all have strong emotions and feelings about where we need to go in Iraq and where we need to go in the Middle East. But this conference is not about each of us expressing our own views. This conference is about each of us learning from our own experience, our different backgrounds, our different experiences, and our different perspectives so that we can come together and begin the process of outlining a long-term strategy of where we need to go and how we are going to achieve success in Iraq and throughout the Middle East. Because as we know, as much as we know that the area and the region is not secure, the other thing that I think we can all agree on is that we have all made mistakes in analyzing of what's going on in Iraq and the direction that we need to go and what the consequences of certain actions would be. In the United States Congress, the United States government and with the American people, we've gone through this process informally of what we call lessons learned, of taking a look at what we have done and the lessons that we have learned and hopeful that we will not make those mistakes again. And let me give you a perspective of some of the things that we have learned and that I think we've come to general agreement on in the United States as how we move forward in Iraq. I believe that at this time there's perhaps, you know, many of you may remember in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, you saw Congress come together that night and stand on the steps of the U.S. Capitol and with one voice, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, and liberals united and we sang God bless America. Four years later, America was divided, divided about the decision to go into Iraq, the decision to come out of Iraq, the decision of where we would go and what we needed to do in America was bitterly divided. But today I think that you are seeing and you will see an America that has more of a sense of purpose, a more a sense of unity, that the threat from radical Islam, the threat of insecurity and instability in the Middle East is a threat 
that needs to be dealt with, it needs to be dealt with with a certain sense of urgency. There is a sense of urgency and agreement that this problem needs to be addressed. Soberly, I think America has also reached the conclusion that there are limits to what we can do from a military standpoint. That a military answer is not the only tool that needs to be in our toolkit as we take a look at fixing the problems and the issues throughout the Middle East. We, we, we recognize that we also must confront the ideology of the threats throughout the Middle East. We recognize that we need to, as we solve the problems militarily, as we solve and work towards dealing with the ideology that is driving much of the stability throughout the Middle East, that we need to forge much closer relationships with the people in the region. There's an agreement, I believe, that there needs to be less arrogance on the part of the American government as to how we move forward and that we have much to learn from the people in the region. And we also recognize that this is going to be a long-term process and that we need to be committed to the long-term and that this will not be a short process, that there's not a silver bullet, as we would say, that if you do this thing, you will fix the problems in Iraq and you will address the issues throughout the region. There are some other things that I don't believe we have come to agreement on, issues that we are still learning about. Sheikh mentioned that the West had a responsibility to fix, a moral responsibility to help fix the problems and the issues in Iraq and throughout the Middle East. I'm not sure that we have reached that conclusion. Personally, I would agree. I agree very much with the statement from Colin Powell that goes along the lines of, if you break it, you have a responsibility to fix it, that you have a moral obligation, that you cannot go in and break and overthrow a government, tear apart the social, the economic, and the political fabric of that nation, and then walk away and create a vacuum. We have seen that that has not worked in Iraq, and we're now also experiencing the same disastrous consequences in Libya. If you break it, you own it, or at minimum you have a moral responsibility to work with the responsible parties in those countries to recreate, to fill that vacuum and recreate the political, economic, and military structure that will enable those people to have a safe and secure and prosperous future. We have not yet learned that we need to listen more closely to the people who live in the regions that we become actively involved and engaged with. Before the United States went into Iraq, I had the opportunity as a member of the Intelligence Committee to travel around the region and meet with the leaders of every single country that touched Iraq except Iran. And also had the opportunity to talk to other people within the region about the threat from Iraq and the consequences of the United States becoming involved in Iraq and overthrowing the government of Saddam Hussein. And almost to a person, every single leader in the region cautioned me and the other members of Congress that I was traveling with about what potentially could happen if America chose that course of action understanding much better than what we did the complexities of the region, 
that perhaps the unintended consequences that our course of action might lead to. America decided to act. We move forward. The good thing about the leaders in the Middle East, our allies that we had built strong relationships with, they recognized that they had been provided the opportunity to input to us as to what the possibilities might be if we became and took the course of action that we did. But to a nation, they all lived up to their commitments and stood with us, even though many of them had perhaps voiced their opinions that that might be the wrong direction. America in the West needs to spend more time actively listening to the people in the Middle East about the direction forward. It is, these are complex problems, and the people in the region, the respected people in the region, have a much better understanding of the course that we need to take and the implications of the various decisions that are being made, and we need to more actively listen and participate and allow the people in the region to become more partners in this process with us than respondents to the actions that we decide in Washington and other capitals throughout Europe. There are questions, there are lessons that we have not learned and that we are not moving forward to. So there are areas where we have come to agreement in the United States. There are areas where we have made progress. And there are areas that still bitterly divide America and are leading to serious discussions and debates that we have not resolved. It's interesting, in the late 90s, if you went to the US Congress and someone did this, and they did a survey, and they said, and they asked members of Congress, the 535 of us who were elected, leaders of one of the, of the, of the global power, the largest global power in the, in the world, and they asked these individuals, how many of you have a passport? How many of you hold this little document that actually allows you to leave the United States and visit other parts of the world so that you can actually learn and listen about the complexities and the issues that we face in the parts of the world where we are expected to participate and perhaps lead. And in the late 90s, roughly 50% of the members of Congress actually had that little passport. That means for Half of the Congress, their world, their experience was defined by the borders of the United States. And yet, they were helping to establish a foreign policy with dramatic impact and results around the world. In America, there's still a big division, and it will be part of this next presidential debate about how critical foreign affairs are to the success and the future of the American people? It's an open question. There are many that want the United States to retrench and to not be as actively involved in the world as what we have been. A second thing that we have not learned, and I've alluded to this a little bit earlier, but we have still not learned that a little bit of humility by the United States might go a long way in, in improving our perception and our effectiveness in the world today. Admitting and recognizing that some of the decisions that we have made may not have turned out exactly the way that we had hoped. Some would say maybe the United States has made some mistakes, but there needs to be a new humility and a new understanding that America can be a partner, but to be an effective leader, we need to listen better to the rest of the world 
and those who understand and who live in the neighborhoods where the United States wants to have an impact. And it was mentioned in the opening comments. The other area, the elephant in the room, as again we would call it in American slang, is Iran. America is deeply divided. The Congress is bitterly divided about what the appropriate path forward is in how we deal with Iran. How do we contain its influence? How do we work through the process of stopping it from getting capability of nuclear weapons, nuclear arms, the nuclear bomb? Do we engage? Do we pass more sanctions? And clearly, as we are talking about the future of Iraq, you cannot talk about the future of Iraq without resolving the issue of how we will deal with Iran. So as America goes through the process of coming together on certain issues where we already have made significant progress, closing the gap on other issues, and identifying the areas where we still need to make significant progress to try to come up with a unified position. We need to remember our focus. Our focus is to solve the problems for the people of Iraq and of the region. I'll never forget some of the people that I met as I traveled through Iraq. I had the opportunity to visit the country 10 times uh, between 2003 and 2010. And I'll never, and I, I wonder what has happened to a group of people. And on one of the trips, we went to the graduation ceremony of a group of police cadets. And we were in a courtyard and they were of a two-story building. And all around the, the second floor and on the first floor, there were cadets that had graduated after American training. They were thrilled, they were excited, they were ready to build and be part of the process to reconstruct Iraq. As we went around and we talked and shook hands with every single one of the cadets on that first floor, we were warmly greeted, happy and excited faces about where they thought and where they hoped that Iraq would go. And obviously the Iraq that we see today is not the Iraq that they envisioned that they would be working in. And the question that I have today is for those, for those individuals who made the commitment to serve their country, what has happened to them? I went to the reconstruction of one of the hospitals in Iraq. And at the building site, I was thrilled. I wrote about it when I came home. There was a young boy, maybe 10 or 12 years old, had his little stand selling bubble gum and candy. A little entrepreneur. It's exciting for someone from the United States to see the entrepreneurial spirit taking root in Baghdad. But what has happened to that young boy? He's now in his early 20s. Where is he? What side is he on? What future does he see? In Iraq, what future does he see for his family and for his region? The challenge that we face today is to develop a solution and a way forward for the police cadets who took the risk of taking on an assignment today, for that young boy, that young entrepreneur, to build an Iraq that can be successful and prosperous for all of them. What it requires is that we all listen, we all learn together, and recognize that there are perhaps strategies that we can agree on, strategies where we are close together, but maybe there are some differences, and also recognizing that there are some severe differences that we may have. But through dialogue and through discussion, we can handle those issues and we can move forward. And we can move forward developing a long-term strategy for what our goals are, what the strategies and tactics are 
that will enable us to reach that goal. That is why we are here. That is why I appreciate the opportunity to interact with all of you, to be able to listen and to learn and to go back to my friends in Washington and say, this is a clearer perspective. This is, these are the things that I learned. These are the things that I want to share with you as we move forward to solve a problem that we are passionate. We are passionate about fixing and we are passionate about being a part of that process. So thank you and thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for your illuminating uh, statement and your frank. And you mentioned the example of the Americans, uh, members of the Congress with, uh, without passport. It reminds me when I used to be ambassador to the UN after September 11, I was once asked to address some legislators, local legislators coming from different states in the Constitution Hall in Washington. And then it was talking you know, about how to develop a culture of respect in the way of fighting terrorism long term fight against it. And I remember addressing hundreds of people in the Constitution Hall. I, I just asked them a question. Please, the people who can speak a non-European language here in the effort of understanding, raise your hand. Nobody. <laughs> then asking other European language, there are few speaking Spanish or French. Uh, it's part of the reality in the effort of understanding each other and creating a better world. Uh, the next speaker on my list is uh, Dr. Ahmed Haqi Mohammed, the Secretary General uh, of the Iraqi Forum for Intellectual and Academics. Please uh, join us. Uh, Salam. أصحاب السعادة يسعدني أن ألقي كلمة الأمين العام للمنتدى العراقي للنخب والكفاءات الدكتور حسن فهمي جمعة الذي حالت ظروف طارئة دون حضوره وقد خولني بإلقاء كلمة المنتدى بصفة نائب الأمين العام للمنتدى السيدات والسادة تسعدني دعوتكم كممثل للمنتدى العراقي للنخب والكفاءات I am delighted to be invited as a representative of the Iraqi Forum for Intellectuals and Academics. The objectives and aims of the conference are dear to my heart because it's working to bring peace to my country, Iraq. To stop the killing fields there and to assist in its rebuilding and development by peaceful means. Ladies and gentlemen, Iraq, as you know, is the cradle of the civilization where writing was invented and the first law of Hammurabi was codified and made public. Iraq's fertile land, its two great rivers, Tigris, and, and the natural resources was the sources of the development of humanity on the face of the earth. Iraqi intellect and manpower were the drivers. My country has had a troubled recently history. This caused heavy loss of life. The destruction of the state and the resulted in millions becoming refugees. Most of the highly qualified professional Iraqis had to escape from Iraq. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our forum to you. It is a new initiative by many hundreds of Iraqi professionals with many years of experience and expertise where are mostly outside the world. Few have acquired citizenship of other countries. Many are asylum seekers and the majority are residing in the neighboring countries. Last year, more than 250 Iraqi university and academic professors, physicians, engineers, economists, judges, lawyers, 
خبراء في الصناعة النفطية والإسكان والاتصالات والزراعة والرأي ومجالات أخرى تجمعوا كلهم في إسطنبول تقريبا كل واحد منهم عنده شهادة عليا من الدكتوراه والماجستير أو شهادة عليا أخرى خبرتهم المجتمعة تجاوزت عشرة آلاف سنة من الخبرة الفعلية هم يمثلون عينة من هؤلاء الذين ساهموا في بناء العراق خلال الخمسين سنة السابقة لاحتلال العراق عام 2003 هؤلاء كانوا يمثلون كل أطياف المجتمع العراقي قوميا ودينيا تجمعوا على أسس غير سياسية وغير طائفية كانوا مشتركين في حزنهم على العراق الذين ساهموا في بنائه كانوا كلهم مصممين على مساعدة الجيل الجديد من العراقيين لبناء بلدهم من جديد Help the new generation of Iraqis to rebuild their countries. None has any political agenda, but all are patriot Iraqis. They aspire to help recreate an independent sovereign Iraq that upholds the values of democracy, rule of law, and equality of all citizens. ليس لأي منهم ليس لأي منهم أجندات أخرى ولا يتطلعون إلى مكاسب أو منافع شخصية وكلهم منزعجون لتصرفات السياسيين الذين يحكمون العراق لهذا المنتدى دستور مكتوب The foundation has a written constitution and internal rules to govern its activities. It is temporarily headquartered is in Turkey and just as NGO, non-profit organization in England. The membership is open to all Iraqis who hold postgraduate degree of at least master's or doctorate or university degree with at least five years post-qualification experience. العضوية مفتوحة للجميع بغض النظر عن الدين، الأرجن، أو الآراء السياسية من الذين يوافقون على أهداف المنتدى. الهدف الرئيسي هو أن تستخدم خبراتهم وقدراتهم في إعادة بناء العراق والمساعدة للتطوير. لقد عقدت انتخابات شفافة والتي من خلالها تشرفت بانتخاب أمين عاما مع أربع نواب وثلاثة عشر عضاء أمانة عام. وقد أسس المؤتمر 12 فريق عمل يتضمن الصناعة والطاقة والثروات الطبيعية، القانون والتشريع، الإدارة والتخطيط، الزراعة والري، التعليم العالي والبحرين، الصحة والطب، الإسكان والبنى التحتية، الاقتصاد، العلوم الاجتماعية، الرياضة والشباب، العلوم السياسية، والتكنولوجيا، المعلومات. منذ ذلك الحين ازدادت العضوية إلى حوالي 500 أبو والهدف هو زيادة الأعضاء إلى ألف أبو كحد أدنى من الأكاديمية العلماء وأصحاب الكفاءات خلال هذه السنة وهذا يشمل من هو خارج العراق وكذلك زملائنا وأصدقائنا داخل العراق لدينا العزم على إقامة دورات ومؤتمرات وبرامج وبرامج تدريبية وصولا إلى مراكز تدريبية لتحقيق أهداف المنتدى وكذلك هناك نية لاستحداث مكاتب استشارية تخصصية في كافة المجالات ومن البديهي أننا نتطلع إلى المجتمع الدولي وخصوصا إلى الاتحاد الأوروبي للمساعدة For help and assistance, وكذلك فإن المنتدى ومراكزه التدريبية ومكاتب الاستشارية سوف يتشرف بأن يأخذ أعمال مهنية لها علاقة بالدول الأعضاء في الاتحاد الأوروبي ووكالات الأمم المتحدة. سيدات والسادة. Ladies and gentlemen, we are absolutely a non-political entity, but our members are Iraqis who live, who live, knowledge and service were spent in the service of their motherland. Governments come and go, politicians and leaders also, but nations remain. We, the Iraqi academics and intellectuals, wonder why some fundamental and basic questions are not being asked. 
This includes Iraq from ethnicity and religions lived peacefully together and sharing everything throughout the 20th century and many centuries before suddenly began to fight and to kill each other after the occupation of 2003. Could the occupation have anything to do with it? Is this no accountability? Does anybody have a duty to help? لا يوجد شعب no people accept في العالم يقبل الاحتلال تحت اي pretext, بما في ذلك ذرائع نشر الدين او الفلسفه هل يفهم الاوروبيون ذلك does the European understand that? Iraqis certainly do even وحتى وحتى وان كان عملهم هل من المنطق أن يعامل الملايين من العراقيين على أنهم ويتم قصفهم من الجو؟ الآن قوات الحكومة العراقية الجوية والقوات الجوية الإيرانية تقصف المدنيين بمشاركة قوات جوية لدول هي أقرب إلى القطب الشمالي من قربها للعراق North and South Poles than to Iraq. What should the millions of Iraqis who are the real victims of ISIS and the hostages of ISIS should make of the bombs raining on their hospitals, homes, and schools, claiming to fight ISIS? Finally, I wish on behalf of myself and the Iraqi Forum for Intellectuals and the candidates to express our gratitude to our generous host, Peace Ambassadors for Iraq, the President of the Foundation, and our Latifian friends for this kind invitation. We would like to assure them and all the honorable representatives of the EU and the guests بأننا سنكون على أتم الاستعداد لخدمة عملكم النبيل هذا مع شكر الجزيل then uh, to whom the, your question is addressed. Uh, please, much more questions than uh, comments. Thank you very much. Any question? Yeah. I don't see any. <laughs> yes, please. Thanks. I'm Steve Clements with The Atlantic. I wanted to ask uh, former Congressman Hoekstra on the topic in which he talked about the Colin Powell doctrine that uh, you know America has a responsibility to restore the civil, political, and economic institutions after intervention. You know, one of the questions I've had leading up on the Iraq War and other things is whether or not many of our planners actually never did a, had the strategic discussion with the American public that that would be part of the process. That that the view of of many in the Pentagon, many in Congress was. Let's support the war, but, but we're not going to talk about the after part, and, and, which is a bit duplicitous. And so I'm interested in how you see that equation, because I often see an incomplete discussion with the U.S. public that's in for the beginning and not for the end, because there's not a lot of honesty and candor about the totality of the commitment. The... Um, <clears throat> I think you've stated it very, very accurately. I think that, uh, as, I as I recollect what, uh, you know, the process and the decision-making that we were going through in Congress, it was difficult enough to make a determination about whether we needed to go into Iraq uh, and what uh, the ramifications would be just from the military uh, activity. and. I don't think that there was very much discussion at all uh, about what the aftermath would be, or that it was it was very very simplified. Uh, that you know there there would be a uh, uh, that Iraq could take care of itself very very quickly. Uh, the discussions of you know, and I think it was very very simplistic. Well, don't worry about it. You know, they they've got a significant uh, middle class. Uh, the infrastructure is, is pretty much in place. 
Uh, and, you know, you can almost, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to bring it up, but, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Well, you know, we got that wrong. Well, we also got wrong exactly what the conditions were uh, in Iraq and understanding uh, the political, the economic, the infrastructural uh, issues that were in place. And I think, you know, this is why I, I bring it up now. This is what I hope will be a lesson learned for America moving forward, although I think we repeated many of the same mistakes uh, in Libya, which is we went in, we broke a system, and then, you know, NATO and America left, uh, and we left and we didn't fill the vacuum. And I hope as we move forward that for policymakers and for the American people, we recognize that when we make a decision uh, and whoever else is in the coalition to go in and make that kind of transformational change and lead that kind of transformational change, that there will be significant, uh, you know, there will be some significant follow-on responsibilities uh, and we didn't do that in Iraq. We haven't done that in Libya. I think and I'm hopeful that we've now learned the case so that we, for two things, we will be more cautious about moving forward on these kinds of issues in the future and recognizing that when we do, we will be honest with the American people that if we take this course of action, recognize that with our military capability, we can fix this relatively quickly uh, and we can win militarily, but to solve the, the problem and to move forward, it's going to take a much longer commitment and the investment of dollars may be much more significant than actual just the, the military. So uh, if the premise is, were we honest and open with the American people about the after effects of the decision to made, that was made to go in and uh, overthrow Saddam Hussein, I don't think we talked about it enough, we didn't fully understand the ramifications, and we didn't have a broad enough discussion. No. Uh, yes, uh, Jonathan Steele, formerly of the newspaper The Guardian. Two points for Mr. Ahmed Haki Mohammed. You mentioned negatively the Iraqi bombing of civilians. You didn't say anything about the U.S. use of air power at the moment in Iraq. Do you support that or not? And secondly, what is the correct way of dealing with Daesh, with dealing with IS? You didn't say what should be done. The forum, in fact, among its aims, it's written, the aims, it is a non-political organization, but the matters of the current Iraq, it is not the American presence. The real problem or issue is the, the Iranian intervention inside Iraq and all the killing and the slaughtering which is taking place it is because of the conflict of different uh, religious ideological. Iran is one of them and the other, and the other is the ISIS. It's conflicting. The forum doesn't see that is talking about the past and the history would lead to sort and the solution, the kind of solution. The forum would like to sort out from the essence of the point, which is the current point. And thank you. Thank you. My question is for uh, I don't Mr. Ahmed as well. I'm Dr. Nazoba Yunus from the Project on Middle East Democracy. Um, your initiative sounds very promising, uh, bringing together intellectuals and academics in a non-sectarian forum where they can, can really come together and discuss some of the issues that Iraq is facing. I wanted to ask what your plan was for translating that initiative into a wider program for reconciliation, particularly beyond Iraq's elites. Uh, which is often where you, you find more progressive views anyway. 
Um, and I also wanted to ask whether you'd been able to hold these types of events inside Iraq. I know that the conference you talked about was based in Turkey. Are you able to do these kinds of programs inside Iraq? This forum, actually, because of the, because of the security inside Baghdad, is enable actually to have a presence inside Baghdad. Because since 2003, more than 500 were, uh, were killed by an international inter intelligence. Iran had played as well an essential role. The security situation doesn't allow for the elite and the intellectuals to hold a conference inside Iraq, that's why we were forced and obliged to hold it inside Turkey. Turkey, as well as a neighboring country of Iraq, and doesn't put any conditions or preconditions to, 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 to have a conference according to the Turkish laws. And regarding to working actually inside Iraq, we have the colleagues actually inside Iraq, I'm whom they are members of the forum, through their presence and work inside the the centers, uh, centers and the universities. We are talking about those whom actually they remain. They are working on the very difficult situation. We are staying in touch at least to understand the root of each problem related to every sex inside Iraq and trying to find a solution in collaboration with the specialists outside Iraq. Yes, thank you. My name is Sabah. I'm a lawyer from Iraq. Uh, the question is to the senator. Uh, you told us about the past. Can we try and look a little bit forward in the sense that previously the U.S. foreign policy on Iraq was to have the surge, to have the sahwa, to have all the solutions which were practiced when the American forces were in Iraq, which it might made it possible. Now that there are no American forces, why is the U.S. still encouraging the creation of a, the equivalent of a Sahwa in the form, although the name is changed into the local army or local police, although it's not legislated yet, the U.S. foreign policy, it's still uh, working on the basis of providing arms to the Sunnis, to the Shiites, to the Kurds, to the government. Uh, so it's giving these, these weapons to everybody. Is this not a repeat performance of the past? The, um, I mean, I, I think the, the part, and maybe I missed this, is it, it is looking forward, and what I tried to talk about is the things that we've got an agreement on, and that that includes spending more time listening to uh, the folks in the region. Uh, I, I might differ with you exactly with what's going on right now. I think the commitment, uh, and this is a, a debate, and this is maybe one of the things that uh, can be discussed uh, over the next two days. You know, the, the, the current actions in Iraq for U.S. and for military is weapons, all weapons going into Iraq uh, are being distributed through the central government in Baghdad. The, the, the weapons going into Iraq, at least according to our policy, uh, go through Baghdad, and Baghdad will determine how, much of the, how many and what weapons will actually be delivered to the Kurds, what will be going to the Sunnis, and it is not the United States that is delivering the weapons directly either to the, uh, the Sunni tribes or being delivered to the Kurds. And if, 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 you're, if, you're, if you're seeing something other than that, uh, I'd love to hear it. But the, but the bottom line on the policy in, in Iraq is that, you know, the United States should not be acting unilaterally. We need to be developing, and this is, you know, exactly who are you talking to in Iraq? Who are you working with that the U.S. policy reinforces the action, reinforces and complements the actions and the decisions of what the Iraqi people believe will lead towards reconciliation and confronting and defeating the threat from ISIS? 
Hopefully we are learning that we need to spend more time listening to the people from Iraq and not acting unilaterally. And if you're seeing something different, then let's talk about it. Thank you. Fouad Rath from the IUBL in Luxembourg. Sir, I, I, my question is to the Senator. Uh, I believe peace and reconciliation can only occur if the threat of Daesh is utterly removed. These murderous killers have to be utterly destroyed and removed. Uh, it is the suspicions of many that they have been armed, supplied, and financed by uh, several intelligence committee, uh, communities. You have evoked intelligence. Uh, recently, some military action, inconclusive and mild, has uh, occurred. My question is, is there any thinking to uh, eliminate the problem once and for all? Thank you. Well, I think there's a tremendous uh, focus and effort uh, with the United States uh, to confront, contain, and ultimately defeat uh, ISIS. Uh, and the way that is going to happen, it is going to require you know, the United States and the EU and NATO are not going to be able to confront, contain, and defeat ISIS. It, uh, they can be part of the solution, uh, but the countries in the region uh, need to be part of the solution. The Kurds need to be part of the solution. The Iraqi government out of Baghdad, the Sunni tribes, Jordan, Egypt, uh, the, uh, the rightfully elected government in Libya, they all need to be part of that solution, and they need to be more active in that process uh, than, than, what they, than what they have been. At the same time, we, again, now and this is part of the conference, but you know, this is now my personal view, uh, and the conference can, uh, and through the conference, this should be a point of the discussion, but how are you going to confront the ideology of, of ISIS and radical jihadism, how do you defeat the ideology? You cannot just defeat ISIS militarily, you need to defeat the ideology as well. Uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of talk and discussion about how that's going to happen, but that is the United States, the countries, and the Islamic leaders all developing a long, broad-term strategy to make that happen. Yes, please. I'm not jumping in too many times. On the issue of, of, of ISIS and, and dealing with it, recently I talked to General John Allen, who's our envoy in the United States about ISIS, and, and he says the uncomfortable truth no one really talks about is that the support for ISIS in the region is really profound and deep. That you look into Jordan, you look into Egypt where you wouldn't suspect there would be support, and there's one, a fear of many that the rise of Iran and the rise of sort of a Shiite network has set many people on edge. They perceive an America in decline that's less decisive, less engaged, and less involved than it was before. Uh, and, and thus, in that, in that environment, they see ISIS as a defender of their interests. And while we may say that's illogical and we don't understand it, it's very clear that the support in many of these nations is much deeper than we say. So when we talk about delegitimization it sounds like a mathematical formula that you can just pull out some mullahs and, and solve it. But when support is much larger than we're, we're willing to admit publicly, what, what kinds of things do both of you think are a much more robust strategy in dealing with that element? Let me uh, first come to your premise as to that the support is much deeper than what we would give it credit to. Uh, I think that's accurate. I think that you know, with a less of a footprint for the United States and less leadership uh, in there that what you described is exactly uh, what is happening, because uh, there is a concern uh, about Iran. The, uh, you know, a, a much more robust strategy uh, is engaging uh, with the folks in the region. Uh, you know, I, again, I personally disagree uh, with some of the steps that the administration is taking. I believe that there are people on the ground uh, in Iraq, uh, who, are, who have demonstrated a willingness uh, and an eagerness to take on uh, ISIS. Uh, and it is the Sunni tribes, and it is, uh, and they are the Kurds. And from our perspective and my perspective, they're not getting the weapons and the equipment that they need to, to wage that a fight uh, effectively. The Egyptians have recently shown an indication uh, to help 
uh, in Libya. Uh, and they've been rebuffed by the administration. Uh, and so those are the types of things and those are, the t those are the areas where we could be showing more leadership and more cooperation and more support for the people that are actually engaged uh, in this fight than what we are. Well, uh, join me, please, in thanking the two speakers of this first session. And uh, uh, we will have now a coffee break for really half an hour. We'll resume at 11.30 exactly. Thank you very much.